So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Dr. Emily Owens talks on prodromal psychosis, risk factors for developing a psychotic disorder, and related treatment. Dr. Owens is a clinical psychologist who specializes in the use of cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindfulness-based approaches for adults and adolescents with mood disorders, anxiety, trauma, and psychotic spectrum disorders. At UCLA, she worked on the North American Prodromal Longitudinal Study, a multi-site study identifying and assessing individuals at high risk for developing psychotic disorders. She completed her internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the West LAVA, providing interventions that met the complex needs of veterans living with psychotic disorders. She is now a staff psychologist at Cognitive Behavior Associates located in Beverly Hills, California, the director of curriculum at the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Institute, and an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA Department of Psychology. Now on to the show. Emily, welcome to Sanity Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, so start off the interview asking people what their approach to therapy is, what's their theoretical orientation. So why don't we start there for you? Yeah, so I'm probably many people cognitive behavioral therapist. Um, I think I and more and more other people are kind of using that as like an umbrella term to cover just anything that deals with cognitive or cognitions and anything that deals with behavior. So in my practice, I'll sometimes do like more traditional Beckian cognitive therapy, but more so I do um, behavioral therapies. So I use like acceptance and commitment therapy, some dialectical behavior therapy, um, kind of tactics, and also mindfulness is, mm -hmm. I think, a big component of my practice. So that's generally where I'm coming from. I also strong belief in the biopsychosocial model of mental illness. Um, so basically, if you just split that word up into three things, it's bio, so like biological, there's biological genetic component to these things. Psycho is like the kind of mental cognitive component. And then social is obviously a social component. So I, I very much try to look at all three of those things um, it for development of illness and onset of illness. Yeah, I think you're the first person to bring up the uh, biopsychosocial model. And we learn it all the time in grad school yeah. and we hear it all the time. Um, like, so what is that, you know, for listeners that are like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, how, what does that even look like in practice or for like treatment? Like, how, how does you actually translate that to like clinical things? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is an education part. So always, you know, I'm teaching people um, we're talking about psychosis today, so I'll just use that as an example. But for just about every mental illness, there's this kind of like idea that there's like a, a biological or genetic predisposition and then some kind of like environmental stress or something else that happens later to actually bring on the onset of the illness. Um, and so mostly the biological piece, I'm kind of using it to explain that like there's some kind of biological vulnerability here or there's you know for um some people it's like for the, your big emotions you have big emotions that might just be a biological thing that we can't probably change too much um so the kind of that's where i go with that and then obviously in therapy we're doing the psychosocial component so we're talking about the way that you think about the world we're talking about the behaviors that you're doing every day that are helpful or unhelpful and then the social component is really huge. Um, it's, you know, social support, social stressors. We, we really need to think about those as a, 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 like, separate and very important for mental illness and, and how it proceeds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some more like, you know, um, like pointed examples, like on the bio side, if somebody has hypothyroidism that's untreated or hyperthyroidism that's untreated, uh, it might be hard to alleviate symptoms until they get the treatment to get their hormone levels um, in check. 
Or on the social side, somebody might be super anxious because they don't have housing. Um, yeah. And you know, the truth is they really do not have housing. And talking to them about not being anxious about it or taking a, <laughs> yeah. taking a antidepressant is not going to fix the fact that they do not have housing. Exactly. Uh, and so that would be this, this social, the social part. So yeah, like considering all three and seeing the person in their outside context and their inside context are, are just so important. Yes. Thank you for, but yes, social factors are also these like broader, right. Constructs that, um, exactly. If you don't have a place to live, you really just can't think about too much. You don't have the mental space or energy to do too much other than deal with that. So incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you're on the show to talk about, uh, prodromal schizophrenia, Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get more into that, but why don't we just start off just with broadly, what is psychosis? Yeah. So I'm glad we're talking about definitions first, because this, the whole, everything I'm going to say, I feel like is, uh, either the, the word is either like a misnomer it's, or it's poorly understood. So psychosis, um, I'll probably use that term the most because it's kind of like an umbrella category for everything else. So psychosis is basically just having some kind of break from reality. Um, Mostly, we think of this as like a delusion, which is like a fixed belief um, that kind of doesn't fit in with what other people believe. And people hold that belief even when presented with evidence to the contrary. So that's one part of psychosis. Another main part of psychosis is hallucination. So this is seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, feeling things that aren't really there and other people don't see or hear. Um, So again, there's so much nuance to all of this, but I think what's important to know is actually a lot of people have these experiences. And so there's a difference between like having a psychotic experience that happens like once or twice, and then like having a psychotic disorder, which means this is happening for the most part, like pretty chronically, it's happening in in a lot of different contexts, it's maybe not really going away very easily. So a lot of people have a psychotic experience at some point in their lives, they even people like without a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. Um, I always share with my patients that I don't know why, but for whatever reason, whenever I move, like move apartments, it's obviously very stressful. So we'll talk about the role of stress again. Um, But I get like, weirdly paranoid. I get paranoid about like my new neighbors. I get paranoid about people potentially like watching me or something. And it, that would kind of qualify as a delusion. It's, there's no evidence that this is happening. It's just all in my head. Um, but it feels very real and it's scary. And for me, that does go away pretty quickly after, you know, I've settled in for a couple of days, but these things happen to people without, you know, actual psychotic disorder. So they happen kind of to everybody. Um, They happen in lots of other mental health conditions too. So I think most classically, we think of like bipolar disorder with psychotic features, depression with psychotic features, Um, but also like PTSD. There's a lot of hearing voices in PTSD, Um, you know, in like borderline personality disorder, there's a, an element of paranoia. Um, anorexia, you can think of as like a delusion about body image. Like there's so much of this across mental health conditions that I, I want to make it clear this is not just confined to schizophrenia. Um, but obviously that is kind of like the quintessential mental health condition that this appears in. So... Uh- happens to regular people, happens across mental health conditions. And then it also can just happen to, I think, anyone under a severe amount of stress. So I gave that example with me for moving. But what I often tell my patients is like, if I sleep deprive pretty much anyone for an extended period of time, they will most likely develop some kind of psychotic symptom. Um, People under, you know, like prisoners of war, like people under severe amounts of stress develop these symptoms. So this is not some just like radical departure that only people with schizophrenia have. It's, it's more common than we think it is. 
Hmm. So it's like in schizophrenia, the, a, a natural state that we could have under extreme stress or physical duress. I'm thinking about like being dehydrated and like in movies, you see people like in the desert and then they're, they're kind right. of uh, you know, discombobulated and, and hallucinating and stuff like that. Um, on the normative experience side, the amount of times I could tell you where I've heard someone call my name when nobody's it, there. Totally. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and outside, I'm like, did somebody call me? Who's yeah. there? And I'm like, oh, I guess I just heard, I just heard a voice. And I think most people listening probably have thought that they've heard something and nothing was there. Yep. So all of our brains are capable of doing this to us. But then somebody with like schizophrenia or an actual psychotic disorder, it's, it's happening a lot and it's very distressing and it's distressing. I mean, when, when it happens to me, when it happens to you, it's, it's weird. It, and so you can kind of get a glimpse into, here comes my cat. Um, <laughs> you can get a, a glimpse into what life might be like for people who are living with this pretty regularly. Um, so you, you had mentioned uh, schizophrenia several times and, and mm -hmm. you know, just kind of saying this is when it's always turned on, it's happening frequently or more intensely and it's chronic. It, it's happening yeah. for extended, extended years. Um, so why don't we go into the, the, the true definition of schizophrenia and then also let's talk about what it's not, what people call schizophrenia, but actually it isn't schizophrenia. Yes, thank you. So this is my cat, Ziggy. He's up here. <laughs> <laughs> Very handsome cat. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a little panther. Um, okay, so so schizophrenia is um, the definition is kind of so this is again, I'm going to go back to the idea. All of this is hotly debated <laughs> in the field. So there is like the DSM definition. And then there's kind of more of like a research definition, which I'm going to go with because I think makes more sense to explain. So Schizophrenia is defined as having um, a set of positive symptoms. And again, positive symptoms, terrible word. It doesn't mean they're good. It means they're extra. So it's like compared to a person without schizophrenia, positive symptoms are something that are present that should not be present in a normal person. So these are the things like hallucinations, delusions, bizarre kind of behavior, bizarre speech, um, so it's positive, meaning like it's present when it shouldn't be. Then there's also negative symptoms, meaning things that should be present in kind of a normal, healthy, functioning individual that are now not present in a person with schizophrenia. So these are the things like, um, you know, lack of motivation, um, kind of like not very much speech, um, feeling really flat, like a very kind of flat affect as opposed to like a depressed or sad affect, but just like flat, kind of emotionless, um, and, and just not like really caring about too much. So mainly a big lack of motivation. So those are kind of like the symptoms. There's also cognitive symptoms. Um, so we see a a pretty significant cognitive decline in people kind of as they develop psychosis, mostly in the areas of like executive functioning, learning and memory, verbal memory specifically. So they have a harder time doing some kind of important things in life. This of course doesn't mean they can't do it. And I always use the example of, um, do you know who Ellen Sachs is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she's a law professor. I think she's a, a professor emeritus at this point at USC who's living with schizophrenia. So obviously people can still function and do quite well in their lives, um, but they're, they probably have a harder time. So three sets of symptoms, positive, negative, cognitive. Okay, and then what is the research def definition? Or that is that is the, research? the research? That's the research. Okay. So it maps <laughs> on, you know, f fairly well with the DSM, um, yeah. the DSM definition. Um, okay. And then what, what are some false definitions of this? So on the, on the true side is people that might be hearing voices and believe it's a true experience. They might have delusions, uh, like they're another person or people are trying to harm them, um, or they're a famous person when they're not or, or various different things. And then they might also talk in such a way that's not so linear 
behavior that's a bit more disorganized, jumping, and they're and you can sort of follow their train of thought, but it goes from A to to like E. Yes. Um, or sometimes it's just completely jumbled, and their appearance yeah. might be disorganized, meaning their clothes might be jumbled, or they might be wearing like odd outfits, or wearing jackets in the summer, um, mm -hmm. no shoes, thing, uh, things like that. And then they also could be very flat, emotionless, and not doing much, and be a motivated. So, so yeah. that's like the the true clinical sense. So what is it not? So it's not, and I feel like I will say this once a week until I die. It is not multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder. Um, the reason for this mix up comes again, misnomer. The word schizophrenia in, I think German, I'm guessing is mean split mind. Um, but the, meaning of that wasn't, it wasn't meant to be like, oh, we have this like split up personality that, you know, presents itself differently. It means literally like the functions of the mind are split. So again, I think Ellen Sachs has like the best quote on this, which is it's the schizophrenic mind is not split, but it's shattered. It's like this dysfunction. It's this disconnection within the mind. Um, so terrible word, the actual and first, um, I guess, categorization or name for this disorder was dementia praecox, or I don't know how to say it, but it was defined as like a dementia that occurs early in life, which I think of as probably would have been a better way to go in terms of naming this, but it was seen as like these people starting to have these cognitive deficits and then basically like symptoms of dementia earlier in life. So, um, terrible terrible words, terrible names all over the place. Yeah. And um, onset is typically around 20 years old. And um, there's that synaptic pruning theory, which I'm not sure how validated it is, but this idea that um, our, our, our brains when we're kids have a lot of neurons. And then as we become an adult for efficiency, our brain starts uh, taking away redundancies to make it more yes. efficient, less energy hungry. And at around 20 is towards, you know, getting at the end of the, of the pruning and there's an over pruning, which might kick people, um, into psychosis. So uh, do, do you know much about that or, or where that is in the thinking around why the age yeah. of onset's around 20? Oh yeah, no, you, you nailed it. So age of onset kind of range is 15 to 25. Um, so yeah, the synaptic pruning thing. So the way I explain this is it, your brain as it's developing, imagine like a city planner planning bus routes and bus stops all around a city. So when you're, you know, young childhood age, you're kind of planting bus stops everywhere. You're planting bus routes all over the place because um, you want to be able to get anywhere. Then around age 10 ish is when your brain city planner kind of decides like, all right, we have too many bus routes. We have too many bus stops. Some of these we're not even using whatsoever. It's become inefficient. It takes too long to get like from place A to place B. So then let's take out some of these bus stops. Let's take out some of these bus routes that aren't being used and really keep and strengthen the ones that are frequently being used. So that's this kind of like parsing down, as you said, of, of the synaptic connectivity. Um, so what seems to happen, what we're kind of thinking is part of developing psychosis is there's an over, it's like your brain overdoes it. It takes out too many bus routes. It takes out too many bus stops. It takes out ones that are being used quite frequently and are important. And so this is correlated, or we, we see this in, um, you know, it, it, there are studies that have taken people in the prodromal phase, which I'll talk about next, but it's kind of like right before, a couple years before developing psychosis. And then they um, did MRI. So they kind of like measured their brain matter and they can see a, a decline in gray matter in people who do go on to develop psychosis, um, which is representative of this over pruning process. It's like there's, there's less synapses and there's kind of less matter there than there should be. Mm -hmm. And just to make it clear, like that's not the only factor here. Yeah. And there's going to be like, like right. situational biopsychosocial uh, so factors many. that that are that could trigger this to happening. In, and it's not like someone is predetermined at birth to have this over over pruning. Okay. It's just one factor of the whole entire equation. Nothing in life is uh, that simple where there's just one thing that's predictive of something complex. 
Exactly. I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the kind of vulnerability stress model, the, the vulnerability is obviously, you know, there's something genetic, but then the stress part, I mean, it can occur prenatally. The stress part can occur in very early childhood. It can occur all throughout. There's so many factors at play here. It's wildly complex, um, which I think is, you know, from a research standpoint, it can kind of be like daunting. I remember um, in the study I worked on, they were starting to look at like immune inflammation factors because they thought maybe something's going on with the immune system that's maybe leading to this over pruning process. And so taking kind of like a crash course in immunology, wild. It's like, so complicated. You think, oh, there's this marker that means inflammation. No, it's like, sometimes it means inflammation. Sometimes it means reduced inflammation. Sometimes in the presence of these five other factors, it means something completely different. It's so insanely complex. Um, but then I think from a clinical side, this means there's a lot of room for intervention. And especially in this like early onset phase, because there's so much happening that there's actually a lot that we can do that can be helpful. All right. So let's jump into uh, prodromal schizophrenia. So what is prodromal schizophrenia? And then I know you're going to say that's a bad name. And why is it it a bad name? (laughs) Because the word prodrome, if you look it up, it means before the onset of. So like if I had a, if I was going to develop a cold or something, um, the prodromal symptoms would be like, maybe I start sneezing a lot or my nose kind of starts to run or something. But that in that context, that means I already have the cold virus. It's, it's just a matter of time. In this context, it's not, uh, it's definitely not a guarantee that a psychotic disorder is going to develop. And that's what I really want to emphasize. So the prodromal kind of phase, basically where this got started was people who had their first psychotic episode, you know, they talked to researchers and clinicians and kind of could tell or could describe, you know, before I had this huge break from reality that got me in the hospital, one to two years before this, I was actually having a hard time. I was struggling in school. I was having some maybe kind of milder symptoms of psychosis. And so, Now we've gotten to the place where we've been able to, and this was the study that I worked on in grad school, kind of identify these people. So the idea, again, is it's kind of a one to two year range before the onset of a full psychotic episode um, where these things are just starting to develop. People who we catch in this range, only about 30% of them go on to develop a psychotic episode or a psychotic disorder of some kind. The rest of them either kind of stay there, they get better, um, they maybe get like slightly worse, but never really go on again to develop a psychotic disorder. So this in no way means, you know, I definitely know what's coming next and I'm going to have schizophrenia in two years. It's not that at all. And what, um, what's the flip? Like how many people with a full, like a full psychotic disorder and schizophrenia have prodromal symptoms? Like, is it a prerequisite oh, right. that it lead like it always leads into it or cause someone just, just, I would imagine you always ease into it rather than one day you're having no symptoms and the next day there's a full on, unless there's something like a, like a major head trauma or some drug episode or stroke or, you know, something like that. That I don't know the number exactly, but yeah, from my experience, I don't know of a single person who went from just like zero to 100. Um, yeah, unless they, but even like using drugs, it's like, okay, you'll have some kind of psychotic experience. It'll kind of go away. Mm -hmm. You'll use again. It'll be more, it'll kind of go away. You'll use it. So it's still, there still is a buildup until it gets to the place where it's just not going away. Um, yeah, I, 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 don't know numbers, but I don't think it happens very often. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what does a uh, prodromal psycho, psycho uh, pro, prodromal schizophrenia look like? Mm-hmm. Um, so the main thing we want to think about and kind of identify is onset or worsening of symptoms. So new stuff is happening, 
kind of odd things are happening that weren't happening before and it's getting worse. Um, this is obviously confusing because this is also the age of the onset of many mental health disorders. So it's very, very confused. That's why not everybody goes on to develop a psychotic disorder, but we're looking at change and kind of decline in functioning. So people who used to do really well at school all of a sudden aren't, um, change and decline in, in social functioning. People no longer wanting to spend time with their friends, spending a lot of time alone in their room. Um, I'm obviously thinking mostly of teenagers here, but adults too, similar things, hard time having, you know, working, things like that. And then these kind of early, um, mild symptoms of psychosis, which are, they're kind of the, I, I want to talk about them because they're the thing that people are really going to notice. If you have like a loved one or a patient or something, this is probably what you're going to notice. That's going to cue you into maybe something's going on here. And the reason it's important to catch people in this range is because early intervention is like the name of the game in psychosis. It is so important. It helps so much with every, everything that happens later, every kind of aspect of the, the illness, um, is improved with early intervention and like reduced duration of untreated psychosis. So like in the study that I was on, we were trying to catch people in this prodromal range um, where they haven't yet developed a full psychotic disorder, but like 30% of the referrals we had already had a psychotic disorder, which was so wild to us and they weren't getting treatment. And so we were able to, you know, connect those people to proper care. Um, but what this says is, yeah, this is obviously happening. Um, it's like worldwide 1%, although that varies kind of wildly between groups. Um, but it, it's happening and people aren't getting connected to care. So the symptom piece, that's what you're going to see. Um, the symptoms, again, it's like this kind of mild form of psychosis. So it might look something like, um, okay, I'm, I start thinking that I'm special and I'm getting special signals from other people or from the universe. I'm not entirely convinced of this. It doesn't really change much about my behavior, but every time I see a billboard that's advertising something I recently thought about, I think someone's trying to send me a signal. I think this is very meaningful. If I really think about it and talk about it, I think it's just random coincidences, but I'm starting to notice this. And then again, over one to two year period of time, I'm going to increase my conviction. I'm going to start being like six months later. No, I really think something's happening here. I, I'm definitely getting these special signals. Somebody's wanting me to do something special. I've been kind of chosen for this. You can talk me out of it, but I'm getting more and more convinced. So again, it's like onset increase. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that, then that would be a delusion. So the, yes. and we often say fixed delusion, which means it's, it's there and it's, it's kind of impenetrable to reason. And this is, I don't know what the opposite of fix would be because I never really, but like unfixed delusion or yeah. not fixed delusion <laughs> where there is some flexibility and there's yes. this, there's this belief, but that you could actually reason yourself out to a degree, but it's still sitting there. Exactly. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Uh, so and we have like, that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hallucinations might be like, I mean, kind of what you experience or where you talk about is like, I keep hearing someone whisper my name. Um, maybe initially this is kind of happening at night a lot, which nighttime we know this is also just another area where people tend to have psychotic, not psychotic, but blips of like hallucinations. People hear things, people see things like as they're falling asleep, very common. But a prodromal person might say, okay, it started that way. Now I'm starting to hear it sometimes during the daytime. When I hear it, I look around. I'm hearing it more and more frequently. It's kind of starting to sound like somebody I know, right? So it's developing. It's worsening. Um, and what about, uh, will there be signs of like disorganization um, in there too? So it depends. I mean, it it's so variable. It depends on like kind of what the maybe delusional beliefs that are starting to develop are. But 
there's definitely um, communication is is one of the symptoms that we look for is kind of a disorganized communication. Again, new, something that hasn't been there before. Now, all of a sudden, I feel like I can't really explain myself to people. Or now, all of a sudden, I start having just totally blink out between in the middle of a thought. And this wasn't happening before. So mm-hmm. there is a little bit of like disorganized communication that can happen. Um, and I can imagine in teen, you know, teens are also already egocentric and think that, you know, people are going to reject them and make fun of them or notice the pimple on their face. Uh, but I can imagine in a pro- prodromal um, situation that that's that there might be paranoia with with like social aspects. Yes. Um, to life. So, so is that coming up a lot? And what does that look like? So much. And that's why this is so hard to differentiate from just like social anxiety, because a lot of the things they'll report is just, it's your average teenage social anxiety. I think people are talking about me behind my back, you know, the mean kids at school, um, hacked into my Instagram account and are doing something mean to me that happens. It happens. Unfortunately it happens. And so it's, as a clinician, you're kind of hearing these things. And, and this is why I like working with this population, because you can really understand where they're coming from. Initially, I think if you see, you know, a 55 year old with chronic schizophrenia, you're like, whoa, how, how did this happen? How are you thinking these things? This makes no sense. At this age, you you're with them. You're like, wow, that that could have happened. That's really stressful. Um, But again, in a prodromal population, first of all, it's not just that that's happening. That's, I think, the most important thing. So if you, yeah, know somebody with a teenager with social anxiety, it's not just that. It's that plus like five other things that are, are very distressing. Um, but it's hard. It's it's really hard um, to, to kind of notice these things. And I think when you start to see the things pile up, that's when your warning signs can kind of get turned on as a clinician or as a, you know, family member. So you said that 33% of these people, or around 30, I I don't know why I said 33, around 30% of these people uh, will develop a full clinical psychosis. How many of people that are having these symptoms come on, particularly in adolescence, actually um, develop out of it? And then at the end, most of the symptoms just remit. Yeah, I think I do have these numbers. Hold on. So remitters after two years, and so this is, this is from, again, this is from the study I worked on. It's called North American Prodromal Longitudinal Study. It's, I think, eight or nine sites around the U.S. and Canada all teamed up to say, we're all going to do the same thing. We're going to find these prodromal individuals. We're going to follow them for two years and assess them at regular intervals and kind of see who develops psychosis. We're obviously going to refer people to treatment. Um, but yeah, so it's, this is how we're getting this information. Um, so people who just fully remitted were totally fine. 30%, uh, 25% remained symptomatic, 20%, um, progressed like, so their symptoms got worse, but they didn't develop a psychotic disorder, if that makes sense. So that's, we we kind of don't know what's going to happen with them. And then, yeah, in this, this specific study was 25% became psychotic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Close close to 30%. Like, um, like what you said. So if we have parents in the audience right now that are just hearing (laughs) in this and they say, Oh my God, my my kid had said something about hearing a whisper or hearing someone call their name or, um, you know, he, he's pretty socially like paranoid about stuff and we're always telling him or, or noticing some of these things. Uh, what, what, what do you have, um, have to, to say to them? So mostly I'm saying it's probably fine. (laughs) You're probably, you know, parents are always overly concerned about these things. Many, and this is, again, it's so hard because many of these are very normal changes that occur in adolescence. People change socially, people change, um, you know, their beliefs, people develop beliefs that are different from their parents. These are all normal, normal, normal things. It's when there's a combination of the kind of the early symptoms, the social decline, the school decline, um, maybe some even cognitive decline with lots and lots of stress. That's really where we're 
starting to maybe get a recipe for something might happen here. But again, most people still are going to develop out of that and be just fine. Um, the, the one kind of special consideration we obviously have is if there's a, um, a genetic predisposition. So if there's a first degree family member who has a psychotic disorder, then we're going to want to really take into consideration some of these changes might mean something's happening. Let's get them into therapy. Let's get them, you know, out of the house. Let's get them doing things that they used to enjoy, which could potentially mitigate some of this. And I think you mentioned it before too, is that another key thing to think about is progression. Is this getting worse? Yes. Are there more symptoms? Is it getting more, more intense over time? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and just to loop back to something that you said before about like, like paranoia and be true. So I, I used to work in, in forensic settings, like forensic hospitals and stuff like that. And we'd always say, well, it's not paranoia if it's true. When someone says people are out to get them, but there's legitimately people yeah. out to get them, that's not paranoia yeah. <laughs> or it's adaptive paranoia. Or if you feel like the system is working against you, well, the system really is working against people and it, it's not paranoia um, when it's true. So I just want to throw that little uh, nugget out there. Um, yeah. In, uh, I think in the study, you were telling me that there's this pretty cool um, risk calculator that you guys were able to develop in order to predict uh, which individuals would develop a psychotic disorder, a true psychotic disorder, or a full mm -hmm. psychotic disorder, I should say, in about like one to two years. Yeah, let me pull up. So, so this is like, you know, they have these risk calculators for, you know, breast cancer. They, they basically take, um, a, a series of measurements and then figure out which of those are super important in predicting who actually develops whatever breast cancer or psychosis in this case. So, um, in these people in the prodromal range, the factors that they found to be quite important for prediction, which is obviously what we want to do, right? We, we, we have this number 30%, we want to be able to say, okay, maybe you actually have a 10% risk of developing psychosis. So let's just get you into therapy. You're probably going to be fine. This other person, maybe you have like a 65% risk. And now we really want to be thinking about more interventions and taking this pretty seriously. So this is the goal with this kind of calculator. Um, but the, so the measures they determine to be important are just age first off, um, and then there's two measures of cognitive functioning. So one is like learning and memory, verbal learning and memory. And then the other is um, like a visual motor or like hand-eye coordination um, kind of processing speed measure. So two of those, two measures of stress. So there's one measure that's um, just, we call it undesirable life events. It could be anything from like, um, you know, your family moves to a different community and you have to go to a different school to, I got in a fight with my friend recently, um, or I had a falling out with a friend. So lots of things fall under that category. Uh, the other stress category is trauma, which is more like kind of capital T trauma. So being assaulted, you know, being a victim of rape or something like that, that has kind of its own special weight to it. Then there's only actually one measure for the symptom. So it's like a combination of what we call unusual thoughts, which is like, um, a, you know, more like the delusional side and then suspiciousness, which is also on the delusional side. So it's very interesting that the hallucination mild symptoms, again, because it happens so often to so many people, it's actually not that great at predicting who's going to become psychotic. So it's more the kind of like mild delusional symptoms. And then the last one is change in social functioning compared to the year before. So um, clinicians who are, you know, um, trained on all of this, they can do all these measures, put it into a calculator and say, yeah, you, okay, have a 20% one year and 22% two year probability of developing psychosis. So Based on that, let's think about what we want to do now. Thinking about the the biopsychosocial model that you had talked about before, it's really interesting that these actually like li line up because you have yeah. uh, the trauma and undesirable life events, which is the social. We have the bio, which is the neuro, the I mean, the neurocognitive. I mean, I don't know if we claim that's exactly bio, but it is more of a uh, 
biological phenomenon rather Mm -hmm. than, and then we have, uh, the, the psych symptoms. And so it it maps on to that model pretty well. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure that's not by accident, but, uh, (laughs) you know, it's just an observation that I'm, that I'm having here. No, I mean, well, so what they did, no, it, it, it was, it was by the numbers. They threw in like, here's all the potential things that we think are going to be helpful in, in developing this prediction. And then fancy math came back with here are the things. So it, it, it's not Got just it. that, you know, the, the researchers put those in, like it's because that's actually what the numbers came back and showed us. So yeah, it does. Got it. It so they didn't say like, Hey, biopsychosocial, let's measure these things. Yeah. And then do it actually was like, let's measure these things. And it was like, it let's measure everything, everything. <laughs> that's what came back. That's, that's really a interesting. A whole bunch of stuff. And then, yeah, the numbers came back with, this is what's important. Yeah. And I'm assuming this was uh, through, through a factor analysis. Yeah. Yeah, I did not do it. <laughs> no, okay. And, and just to explain factor analysis for for people that don't know, it's it's a big, complicated math complication. And back before computers, like people would be doing it on paper and pencil for like a like months in order to do these things. And now we could click one button and it pops out in like twenty seconds. Maybe not, maybe not even twenty seconds. Yeah. Uh, basically, what it does, it looks at what things um, that are being measured are similar to one another and groups them together, mm-hmm. and it sees how much it explains of what we're what we're looking for. So, for example, and I don't know the numbers here, but just just going here, um, it might say, okay, well, we measured a bunch of things; they go together, and they're all related to trauma. And this explains, say, twenty percent of this idea of what is the risk of of schizophrenia. So, it's a math way of group things together and understanding how much it explains uh, about something that we're looking at. Yep. I don't know if that was <laughs> the clearest explanation, I, but that's the yeah. explanation I got. Yep. I just call it fancy math. I yep. don't, I, <laughs> I used to know some of these things and now I'm just like something, something happens. This is what we got. <laughs> yeah. No, in grad school, I love factor analysis. So I actually did it on my dissertation. I created my oh, own, like, you know, nice. my own scale and all that. And it, it was fun. Um, one thing that, that you hadn't mentioned in there, but I know that you had told me before is very important to consider is also race, yeah. that there is a disproportionate risk um, for within within this category. So maybe you could talk a bit on that. Yeah. So, I mean, so this does go back to that social piece and obviously the stressor piece. So, so like I said, it's um, about like 1% of the population in the whole world has something like schizophrenia. But that's not an even distribution. So it's more common in males than females. And then um, the stats are in the U.S. It's, I think, three to four times more likely in black Americans and then like three times more likely in Latino Americans. And this was something I just remember like being in grad school and hearing so many of these presentations where it would just be listed right alongside like other risk factors like you know, some kind of prenatal complication. And, and so it would just be kind of bullet pointed. And I want to highlight it because we have to think about what does this mean? So if there's more, uh, more people diagnosed in these populations, either that means it's actually happening more for these populations, or it's being overdiagnosed in these populations. Um, So probably the answer is both, some of both, but even just thinking about the fact that it's happening more to blacks and Latinos and other kind of racial minorities, immigrants, just literally being an immigrant is like its own risk factor for psychosis. So we have to think about why, and that goes back to the stress model. It's, you know, the stress of uh, discrimination, the stress of other, so many racial disparities, you know, physical health disparities. There's so much that goes into that factor that I think it's incredibly important to think about because these are generally things that, you know, from a very broad scale, like public health vision could be mitigated Mm. pretty significantly. And then you also mentioned the fact that early intervention is a really key into helping things not develop. And, and we know that healthcare has disparities 
uh, in our country. So I, I could only imagine that that also has an impact where somebody might be having symptoms, they're not getting their early intervention, oh, yeah. where another population might be getting that early intervention, and that could have an impact on how many people go on to develop a full psychotic disorder. Absolutely. And the, the one thing that happened over and over again when I worked on this prodromal longitudinal study is, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, the number of people who came in driving from hours and hours away because they don't have anywhere else to go. Because we are a free research clinic. I mean, we actually paid our participants and there was nowhere else for them to go. Other states people were driving in from to come. Mm. And we're only doing assessments. Like we're not even really giving people treatment. We're referring and we're doing the best we can co to connect people to treatment. But yeah, the lack of resources for especially like a lower socioeconomic status population is really, really heartbreaking and creates a lot more problems than there need to be. Yeah. And, and part of it's also, I like, you know, you're mentioning people driving for hours with access and I'm hoping that, um, you know, one thing that comes out of, out of the, you know, social distancing and, and COVID with, with telemedicine, and we're even, we're oh, doing yeah. this over zoom is that I'm hoping that this is going to increase access for these areas where people, there's just no one, there's just nowhere there for them to be able, a way for them to be able to get it. Completely. Yep. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So we talked about what psychosis is. We talked about, uh, what pro prodromal is. Um, and you also, we just mentioned for the second time, how important intervention is mm -hmm. for intervention, early intervention for prevention. Um, what are these treatments? What are these interventions <laughs> out there? Uh, if somebody is experiencing these symptoms, what do they look for? The main one I'll say is CBT. Um, the other one is a family treatment called family focused therapy. So, I mostly do CBT, so I'll talk about that, but the family intervention is certainly part of it. Um, so in CBT for this kind of prodromal population, it, again, it's so variable that you really, you're just coming from like a case conceptualization framework. Like you just really need to do a good assessment and kind of figure out what's important to this person because by definition, these you know, mild psychotic symptoms aren't going to be happening too much or too frequently that a lot of the times it's not even the person's most important thing. Like the most important thing might just be your run of the mill social anxiety or might just be, you know, um, like having some trouble with schoolwork. So you really, really need to do a thorough assessment and like understand where is this person coming from? What, what are they looking for from therapy? and then go from there. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things I wanted to say is for clinicians, you know, I'll get referrals sometimes from somebody who already had a therapist and then started to talk about some of these prodromal symptoms. You know, I'm thinking I'm hearing voices or something. And a lot of people, you know, rightfully so, but the, people kind of balk at that. They, they freak out. Uh, clinicians do. Um, and what I want to say is, in this early stage, I really think most people, most good CBT clinicians can kind of handle this. Again, you're, mo you're probably going to be talking mostly about social anxiety. You're probably going to be doing exposures like, let's go hang out with your friends and see if you feel better. It's pretty run of the mill. Um, but the, the big emphasis is on the assessment piece and the psychoeducation piece. So more so than with my other, you know, run of the mill anxious clients, I am going to talk a lot about stress and the role of stress. And I am going to think pretty early on about potentially trying to decrease some stress if there seems to be a lot. So we might do things like school interventions, you know, trying to reduce some workload or get some additional help. Um, we might do things, uh, I think the family comes back and to this piece where if there's a lot of stress at home, uh, we really want to look at that because, so there's this, um, I call it just kind of like a special form of stress that turns out to be really important for, it's all mental illness, but it's, um, psychosis specifically that in the family, if there's, it's called expressed emotion, which is this kind of attitude that caregivers develop towards a family member with a mental illness. 
that's some, it's, it's critical. It's kind of overly involved. It's sometimes hostile. And if that's going on at home, again, this is like a kind of special form of stress that can really, uh, be an, an important factor in like progression of illness. So if that's going on, we definitely want to talk about family therapy, um, other types of family interventions to try to reduce some of that stress at home. So basically I think it's kind of just regular CBT, big emphasis on the assessment, because again, you, you really want to understand like, when did these things start? How are they developing? How are you thinking about these things? Normalize, right? Going back to what I said at the beginning, like you're not the only person this happens to, this actually happens a lot. It's okay. We can deal with this. Um, and then talk about stress and, and the role of stress and potentially do some things to mitigate stress. Then it's just pretty much regular CBT. Yeah. And, you know, not getting too caught up on trying. I mean, I, I guess you'd want to address the symptoms in, in some capacity, but it's not losing focus that just because there are these symptoms here, like psychotic symptoms here, don't lose focus on the rest of the life, the social part, the social stress, because that is a major factor that exactly. causes symptoms to progress. So if you get too pigeonholed on saying, oh my God, there's a delusion. Oh my God, there's hallucinations. <clears throat> and you're not looking at that other side of it. You can miss a massive part of what this treatment would, uh, what an effective treatment would be for this. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, the most helpful thing might just be, let's, let's get you to hang out with your friends again. And let's do some behavioral experiments with that. Let's see. And then, yeah, the, if they're maybe having some paranoid thoughts about their friends then you can look at those just like you would, in a social anxiety case where you would say, okay, did these things happen? How did you know? What were you looking for? Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, how did you feel? Most of the time people are going to be feeling better when they're out, you know, with their friends. So, um, I guess I will say some people have, a, as a part of psychosis and prodromal psychosis, there's kind of a, um, a reduced tolerance for social situations. So when things sometimes to think about, I'm thinking of a patient I have right now, but when she, when uh, this person specifically is with in a social situation for a long period of time, like four hours, she kind of starts to wear down and not feel so great. So we are like, let's spend two hours with your friend then. And then things are great. She has a great time. She feels better. She's out of the house. So it's, it's looking at things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we, we would both probably recommend not flying blind, blind with this though, that even though you know your CBT skills, yeah. if you're working with someone that's starting to have prodromal symptoms, uh, do the research, get the yes. training, get the consultation, you could probably learn to do this and address this. But, but of course you should learn how to do it to, to yes. address it. Yeah, there's so I mean, there's lots of trainings out there. There are specific CBT for prodromal psychosis trainings. Um, there's also CBT, P, CBT for psychosis, like full psychosis trainings. And I, I really think people will find it's it's with any treatment, obviously, you know, you're going to get better with supervision, you're going to get better with consultation, you, you do want to be doing those things. But it's just it's not that different. There's just like a couple tweaks that you make. You definitely do want to be engaging the person and, and, you know, talking about these things. You don't want to avoid talking about it, but it's, it's not wildly different, mm -hmm. especially in this prodromal population. Um, when should people refer out? When does it get to a point where it's like, okay, we, we definitely need to have this person go to somebody with a specialization yeah. in psychosis. Yeah. I mean, the most obvious answer is if, if there is like a, a full psychotic break. So if they end up in the hospital, um, and you're not comfortable with that, then obviously do refer out. Um, and before that, I mean, I, I think, you know, we all need to know our limitations. We all need to know at what point is this becoming maybe more of a CBT for psychosis case is, you know, if hallucinations or if delusions are really the subject of every, session and I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, then yes, let's definitely refer out there or get consultation, supervision, training, you know, things like that. Okay. Um, so if people want to, um, 
keep track of what you're doing, checking mm-hmm. out the research, or even just work with you as a, as a patient? Is there a website or social media way of, of, of following you? Yeah, um, the website is cognitivebehaviorassociates.com. Um, I think that's the same thing for our social media. We don't do a ton of social media, but mostly just the website is cognitivebehaviorassociates.com. Okay, and, and they could find your information and, and, yeah. and things on there. Okay, yeah. and you had mentioned some, um, I, I love to finish off giving people resources just in case they want to. So uh, you had mentioned some trainings that, that were out there. Do you have specific trainings or websites or organizations that you recommend people that want to learn more of how to do these therapies go to? There's the North American Cognitive Behavioral um, Psychosis Society. They have lots of good trainings. Um They have like three day trainings too. So like very intensive and then you can get supervision afterwards. There's also um, through the APA, they have, um, it's called SMI Advisor. So it's a clinical support system for people treating serious mental illness. It's like a SAMHSA initiative. They have you know, quick little kind of hour long trainings and CBD for psychosis. It's, it's kind of more heavily geared towards psychiatrists, but I think there's a lot of good information on there. Um, and you know, questions that, that a lot of people have. And on the training side, so, uh, CBT, uh, P like, is that what you say that it's for prodromal symptom? Is that, is that the CBT training that you want to look for? Is there like a separate, a separate type of training? For so there is a separate and I'm I believe it would still be with that group. Um, there is a separate prodromal training mm. that you can do. I'll, I don't really think you would need to do both. I think if you know CBT for psychosis, you can just kind of like apply it. But there, yes, there there is CBT for prodromal psychosis um, that you can training that you can do. Okay. And if there's somebody that's looking for a clinician who specializes in in this, is there uh, a website or directory for people that are certified or um, an organization to to check into to to try and find one of these people? Not really. I don't think. I mean, we're trying to develop that, I think, through um, ABCT, the, the schizophrenia kind of subgroup within that is we're, we're working on that. Um, again, I mean, this is kind of why I want to do this because I think there do need to be more clinicians who are, who are able to do this work. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, definitely keep me posted on that resource. Yeah. Cause if it's there, I would love to put it out there for people that, that do need that help. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, come on the show. Uh, I think, you know, it, it was in, uh, an incredible talk, you know, learning about psychosis, learning about prodromal, what's the difference, risk factors for developing, and then also some, some parts of treatment that, that people could do if they need, need help with these symptoms. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was fun.